If you grew up in the 2000s, the name Norton probably doesn't mean much to you other than the name of an antivirus package that you don't respect very much. However, Norton used to be a very different name with very different connotations, and they used to be associated with much better software. The Norton name began with Peter Norton Computing, which was founded by Peter Norton in the early 80s, uh, who developed an undelete utility for recovering some files he deleted off his computer. He went on to build an empire around this and other little pieces of software, uh, including the Norton Utilities, which it seems like everybody owned a copy of in the late 80s and 90s. Norton Utilities was stuff like a disk defragmenter and a file system integrity checker and a whole bunch of other little things that just made using the computer a little less intolerable. There was also Norton Commander, their file manager, which almost everyone seems to remember because it got cloned onto every single platform in existence. In addition to that, he had a book about how to program the IBM PC that was called The Pink Shirt Book, for obvious reasons. And with all these things combined, by the end of the 80s, his company was thriving and was pretty much a household name for computer users. In 1990, however, he sold the company to Symantec. I'm not sure how big a deal they were at that point, but they turned around and started putting the Norton name, which was highly recognizable, onto their products, including their antivirus package, which began the long, slow slide to the point where Norton now just means antivirus. This was probably inevitable, since most of the stuff that the Norton Utilities were doing ended up getting rolled into operating systems. Things like disk defragmentation and file system integrity checking are now done transparently by your OS and have been for decades. So the Norton Utilities were not going to stay relevant, but it still just really frosts me when a company takes somebody else's recognizable and respected brand and starts putting it on their stuff just to increase the sales of their stuff, even though there's nobody from that company actually working on the stuff. It's just a huge dick move. At any rate, the Norton brand was still quite relevant throughout the 90s. They had a lot of irons in the fire under that trademark, and people remember a lot of software from that time. But of course, the thing I'm interested in is the one I don't ever hear anybody talk about. Norton Desktop. Never heard anyone mention it in passing, never heard anybody give an opinion on it, nobody's ever said, oh, I missed that thing. But I've seen it mentioned in various abandonware websites and magazines, just by name, and I've always wondered what the heck it is. So I finally recently decided to go investigate and find out what it was all about, and it was not at all what I expected. It's actually quite a bit more impressive than I expected. So, brass tacks. Norton Desktop is an interface enhancement for Windows 3, which overhauls the GUI to give it a lot of things that really it should have had from the get-go. They had three major releases in 91, 92, and 93. The first two will run on Windows 3.0. The third one will only run on Windows 3.1. I don't have time to show you all three in depth, so we're gonna go with version three because it's the most impressive of the three. I'll show you a couple screenshots of the other ones later. They're still pretty cool, but three is really cool. Also, since we're talking about years, I wanna make one important point before we continue. Even in the last year of Norton Desktop's development, nobody knew what Windows 95 was going to look like. So anything you see here that looks like it could have been cribbed from 95 was actually taken from something else, most likely Mac OS. So let me begin this demo by showing you what the basic Windows 3 experience looked like at the time so you understand where we're coming from. I just installed this copy of Windows 3.1. Now, while this was a significant improvement on Windows 3.0, compared to other operating systems that existed in the world at this time and the capabilities of the PC, Windows 3.1 was shockingly barren. Compared to Mac OS, for instance, it just doesn't provide much firmament, and I'm speaking literally when I say that. When you first launch the OS, you see Program Manager just floating in the middle of the screen, and that's it. This is the only thing you get, this one window floating in a sea of teal. From here, you can navigate through these folders to find shortcuts to all your installed programs, and this is how you get to everything in Windows 3.0. This is not just a replacement for, say, the Start menu. This is a replacement for everything. The entire Windows interface in version 3 consisted of just this window. Everything else you could do was a separate program you had to launch. If, for instance, you just selected all your program groups and deleted them, which was not difficult, you were left with essentially a useless computer. The only way you could do anything was to go up to the menu, go to Run, and type in the name of a program that you wanted. While you might call the big teal space behind the program manager the desktop, you can't actually do anything with it like a desktop. You can't put icons on it, you can't interact with it in any way. The only thing that ever goes on the desktop is minimized windows. If you minimize a window, it becomes an icon over in the corner, and that's it. Now, if you grew up on Windows 95 or later, like me, this interface might actually make you uncomfortable because there's nothing to pin you down. The window is just floating here in this sea of color and there's nothing behind it, nothing to get a grip on, nowhere to put your feet. It feels like you're Mario standing on a platform with just 
sky and clouds all around you. And you can stomp on a Koopa and knock him off and he just flies off and disappears. And you know that if you stepped off, you would just go nowhere. The desktop here is intangible. It is only there because something has to fill the void. Windows has to put something where there's nothing. So you've got the desktop, just a solid color. Or if you really want to, you could put a background image back there. But I don't think it really helps very much. You still just feel like you're floating in this infinite space. And since you can't put anything there, Windows 3 to me has this feeling of impermanence. There is nothing to the operating system. There is just the programs you're running on it. Even Program Manager feels like a program. You can customize Program Manager to some extent, but it feels shaky and impermanent. With Windows 95, the desktop changes into an active living thing. You can put shortcuts to your programs there, or you can even put files there that you're using right now. It realizes the desktop metaphor, the desktop being a big flat spot where you just pile stuff because you're too much of a mess to put it away. Your tools are there. The things you're working with right now are there. The things you were working with two weeks ago are still there because you haven't put them away. But it's your place to do with as you like, and a computer should feel like that. The moment Windows 95 came out, people immediately knew what to do with it. They treated it like their living space. If you worked on a computer as a technician, you never knew what you were going to see. Maybe the desktop would have just the default icons, or maybe it would have a carefully arranged set of links to everything they use on the computer, organized into folders with categories, or maybe it would just be 500 files because all they ever do with the computer is just drop stuff on the desktop. It had a physicality to it. It could be lived in. And that's why Windows 95 had such an indelible effect on culture. The reason so many people have this powerful brain bug about Windows 95 is it was the first time that PCs felt like an old worn couch that you had gotten just the way you wanted it. We remember Windows 95 as this house that we all once lived in. Yes, we moved out, but it was the first place that was ours. Now, it's very peculiar that when Microsoft made Windows 3 and they were stealing ideas from Apple or whoever else, they didn't steal this one. They took a lot of other ideas, but they didn't take the desktop metaphor. It's such a strange decision. Mac OS would let you store anything you wanted on your desktop from day one, and that is a big part of why the Macintosh became so loved so quickly. It's bizarre that Microsoft passed up the opportunity to steal that, but that's where Norton Desktop comes in. In 1991, nobody knew yet what Windows 95 was going to look like, but they had seen Mac OS, among other things, and they knew that Windows 3 was not at the top of its game. So I think that as people started to do more things on the PC, and particularly more things they used to do on the Macintosh, they started to get really irritated at the UI on the PC being so inferior. Now, an important thing to understand about Windows is that it has always included mechanisms for customization, pretty much from day one. So in Windows 3.1, you can alter a lot of parts of the OS if you have software development skills. But the most basic one you can change is the shell. Program Manager is just a program. It's just an EXE that's launched when Windows launches, and if you close it, it forces Windows to close. Windows calls that program the shell, and you can simply edit in any file to change that. So when we install Norton Desktop, that's what it does. And let's look at what that looks like. Installing it is not difficult. It comes on six floppies. You feed them in one at a time, follow the wizard steps. And when you're done, Windows launches into a completely different interface. Instead of launching Program Manager, the Norton Desktop is launched instead, and it is dramatically different. Immediately, you'll notice that there's icons on the desktop now, or perhaps more scathingly, there is a desktop now. The ground has arrived. So we've got our disk drives, uh, just A and C. If I had a CD-ROM driver loaded, I'd have a D drive. And then we've got a trash can, uh, which makes it pretty obvious that they're cribbing ideas from macOS. We also have shortcuts for Norton Backup, Norton Antivirus, and Norton Viewer to sell you even harder on the software you already bought. At the top of the screen, we have a system menu bar that's got everything that was in Program Manager, plus access to the Norton Program Groups, access to Norton Desktop Customization, and a couple other things. Quick Access brings up Norton Desktop's replacement for Program Manager. Uh, it actually loads all the same Windows Program Groups, uh, but you can do a few further customizations. Uh, for instance, if you'd like a much more compact program window, you can change it to Toolbar Mode, where it changes all the icons into these nice little compact buttons. Below the menu bar, we've got this toolbar that gives quick access to various things in Norton Desktop, like a Run Dialog, or the Program Groups, uh, or a DOS box. So those are all the parts of the basic desktop that you see right away, uh, with one final crowning achievement. If we open up a file manager, grab a file, and drop it on the desktop, we can now create a shortcut to it. It's a simple feature, but I'd call it the worst missing feature in Windows 3.
Side by side, these two interfaces are nearly unrecognizable. Norton Desktop has ship of theseist windows into a completely different beast. You don't even have to run Program Manager all the time anymore. That was a mandatory feature of Windows 3. It was always there. So Norton Desktop has fundamentally altered Windows 3's user experience. Unsurprisingly, since they were making so many changes already, there are tons of customizations the user can then go apply. Uh, the customizations window is in fact so deep that it has a graphical map to make it easier to pick the thing you want to modify. Uh, in fact, check this out. Let's uh, swap the drive icons from left to right, uh, remove the Norton shortcuts, apply a desktop background, disable the toolbar and the title bar, and then rename the trash, and you could be forgiven for thinking for just a second that you were looking at Macintosh System 6. I mean, you wouldn't be fooled for long but you would be fooled and you wouldn't expect that to be possible from Windows 3. Now, this is not quite Mac OS. Uh, for one thing, it might be obvious, but the menu bar at the top does not display the menu for the currently selected app like it does in Mac OS. This is pretty much impossible on Windows. You're not supposed to be able to do it. However, about 10 years later, there were programs for Windows customization that would do this. They were just very janky and were doing stuff you were not supposed to be doing. At any rate, Norton had not figured that out, so this doesn't do it, and it's a little frustrating because it really would have sealed up the experience and given you a little more desktop real estate. It's also a little irritating because when you maximize a program, it covers up that menu bar. It makes sense since it's not actually the menu bar for the program you're using, but it means that you can't treat it as a proto start menu, which would have been a nice touch. Also, while we have a trash can on the desktop, it's not the Macintosh trash can. On the Mac, the trash can is basically just a folder. The only special thing about it is that you can empty it very easily by going to the menu bar and emptying it. Otherwise, you can put a file in there and use it as storage if you want. It's pretty much just a folder. The way it's implemented is, is more meta than that, but the, the point is the user can treat it as just a folder. You put files in there when you think you don't want them, and then when you're sure you don't want them, you get rid of them for good. Norton Desktop's trash can is nothing like that. It seems more like an undelete utility with some dipping mustards included. If you're not familiar with undelete, it's a technique for restoring deleted files uh, by using a exploit in the file system. When you delete a file under a normal DOS FAT system, the file isn't actually removed from the disk. It just flags it as deleted in the file table. An undelete utility can go through the file table, recover the original info about the file, and then go recover it off the disk if it has not yet been overwritten by another file. This is, again, what got Peter Norton on the map to begin with, but that was 10 years earlier. We would have hoped for a little more sophistication at this point, but unfortunately, the trash can here seems to just be an undelete utility for the most part. It includes something extra called Smart Can. I couldn't understand how it worked from the documentation. I couldn't find any info about it online or anything. It claims to protect deleted files, but I don't understand how it does that. And I really wish that they had just hooked the DOS delete API and redirected it to custom code that would make it behave like the Macintosh trash can. So a funny thing about that. I couldn't find any documentation on SmartCan in Norton Desktop, but while collecting footage after my recording session, I discovered that Norton Utilities for DOS does contain documentation for it, and it does exactly what I wanted exactly the way I proposed. SmartCan is a type of program called a TSR, which replaces the DOS delete command and redirects it to Norton's own code, which instead moves deleted files to a hidden directory, mimicking the Macintosh approach. Now, why their interface for this in Norton Desktop is this list view, I don't know. It easily could have been a simple folder view, just like the Mac or the later Windows 95 Recycle Bin, which would have made the underlying functionality much clearer. And they could have explained how it actually worked in the Norton Desktop help file, but instead they don't mention any of the details that are clearly spelled out in the DOS version. So if you weren't familiar with SmartCan already, this would not have been very reassuring, which is a shame because in reality, this seems to be just as solid and trustworthy as the Macintosh trash can. It's still a missed opportunity, if you ask me, just due to poor communication, but I wanted to give credit where credit was due. It looks like they really did do this the right way, and it's a very cool improvement to Windows. One of the things that you might not notice at first if you started looking at this is the deparenting of several major programs. Let me explain what the heck I mean by that. Let's take the File Manager. Under Windows 3, it's a program called File Manager. It uses a windowing style that was extremely popular throughout the 90s called Multiple Document Interface, or MDI. MDI is not well loved anymore for the most part. The idea is that when a program has subwindows, those subwindows should live inside of the main parent window, treating it like a sub desktop. For instance, in the original Windows 3.1, if I open File Manager, then open two folders, when I minimize one, you can see that it becomes an icon in the corner 
not of the desktop, but of file manager itself. There are a bunch of downsides to this paradigm. Uh, for instance, if you want to open two file folders, put one in the lower left, one in the upper right of your screen, you can't do it unless you maximize the file manager window. Otherwise, when you drag these sub windows past the edges, they'll just disappear. This means that you can't interleave these folder windows with anything else on the machine. If you open up a notepad and then you click on one of your folder windows, it will bring the entire file manager to the foreground, covering up everything else. This unequivocally sucks. Now there are a bunch of programs that legitimately use MDI, and there are still some that use it now. A lot of creative software like Photoshop is based on an MDI design, and it works fantastic for those. But in the 90s, people were applying it to all sorts of things it didn't belong in. Windows 3 is full of unnecessary MDI applications, uh, primarily Program Manager and File Manager, in addition the Clipboard Viewer for some weird reason. Norton Desktop doesn't change these programs, uh, however, if you open up, for instance, its file browser, you'll see that it is not part of a parent window, it's its own first class window. Of course, it's also a completely new program that Norton has written from scratch, but we'll get into that later. Now I can open up two folders and a notepad and interleave the windows. I can even open a program group because Norton Desktop replaced Program Manager as well, and none of these programs are MDI. They've been replaced, and in doing so, they've been broken out of their MDI prisons, and it seems completely normal to use a computer like this now, but these major parts of the Windows 3 operating system did not let you use them in a sensible way, and Norton Desktop fixing them, I would say, is the crowning achievement of the entire package. Like, lock it up, boys, go home, we're done. Just that enhancement alone justifies the cost of the whole program. If we take a look at this new file browser, at the bottom there's a bunch of toolbar buttons. Among them is one called View. You might think this would just open the file in an editor, but actually, it expands the window and adds a preview pane. Now remember that Windows 3 did not have thumbnails. In fact, I don't even think Windows 95 had them. I don't think they added that to Windows 98. So if you were going through a folder with several hundred bitmaps in 1993, you had to open the first one in MS Paint and then drag each file one at a time to see what you had. With this new preview pane, you just press down, 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 down. You can look at each one as quickly as you can press the key and it can load from the hard drive. And that could save you hours of work a day dragging things into MS Paint if you were a person who dealt with a lot of media. Also, this is not just for images. It's actually an embedded version of another app called Norton Viewer, which is sort of a universal file viewer. You can drop just about anything into it and it will try and figure out how to display it. If you drop in a text file, you see text. If you drop in an image, you see the image. If you drop in an EXE or DLL, you see the file headers. If you drop in a zip file, you see the contents of the zip. I'm not sure all the things it supports. I'm sure there's a huge list, but this is a pretty cool utility to have built into your file browser. Hell, the current Windows thumbnails won't even show you the contents of zip files. Another new feature is the ability to right click for a context menu. This may seem absurd, but the right mouse button was not very heavily used in this era. Yeah, it was there, any program could use it, but a lot of stuff, especially in the base Windows OS, didn't actually do anything with it. In fact, in the original Windows 3.1 file manager, right-clicking does nothing. Now, context menus were not expected yet at this time, so Norton Desktop also does not, by default, give you one. Uh, if you right-click in a file view, you actually just add files to your selection, like control-clicking does now, but you can go to the customizations and turn on a context menu that's much like a modern one, which would be a huge productivity boost. There's all sorts of other little enhancements, of course. Uh, you can filter your file listing in different ways, you can invert your current selection, you can launch a DOS box that's in the currently selected folder, all neat things, but there's one feature in Norton Desktop's file browser that rises so far above the rest that I can't believe it's real. It's one feature, and this feature really truly is worth the price of admission. Just this, nothing else. If this was the only thing that it did, I think the package would have been worth buying. Folks, Norton Desktop has zip integration. I can select a group of files, I can go to the file menu, and I can select compress and make a zip file on the spot. I can even put a password on it. And of course I can decompress zip files as well, but even more exciting than these, I can go to the menu and turn on view zip files as folders. And this allows me to expand them live in the tree view and see their contents. I can then drag files out of a zip to extract them or drag files into it to add them to the archive. This is an astonishing feature to find in 1993. It would not appear in mainline Windows for like five more years, at which point it was only in the Windows 98 Plus pack. So the first time you would find this for sure on a new computer would have been in Windows Me, which I think was in 2000. I think Mac OS didn't get this for even longer, and even when all those OS's did, it actually wasn't as slick as this. 
I don't even think it's this slick now. Considering that a tremendous number of people at this time were still using PK zip on the command line for their zip operations, I think anybody would have fought you for this program. If I'd had this in 1993, you wouldn't have been able to pry it out of my fingers. Okay, well, I was five. You would have been able to, but I would have been really mad at you. Okay, so, so far we've seen changes to most of the core Windows UI. Norton Desktop has achieved really impressive changes to everything that constitutes Windows itself. But what's left to do on the computer is all going to be in individual applications. And of course, Norton Desktop can't really enhance those too much. That's not to say it doesn't enhance them at all, however. Here's a little bit of Windows trivia for you. When you go to open or save a file in most programs, the window that pops up where you can pick the file to open or save is not actually generated by the program itself. Most programs don't have their own custom file selector dialogs. They just ask Windows to give them a file picker UI. And then after the user finishes their selection, Windows goes back to the program and says, okay, the user picked this file. This is called a common dialog, and it's a technique that Microsoft introduced to allow programs to automatically get improvements when the OS changes how it does something. So if the open dialog in Windows gets an enhancement because there's a new file system feature, all the programs that use the common dialog get that enhancement automatically without even needing to be recompiled. If I open up Notepad in the original Windows 3.1 and I go to File Open, you will see the incredibly crusty Windows 3 file picker, and it is truly awful. You can't do anything from here. You want to make a new folder to save in? Tough. You want to rename a file? Tough. You want to delete a file to make space? Tough. You've got to go to File Manager and do that separately. Well, now let's go to our Norton desktop machine, open Notepad, and go to File Open. This is the exact same Notepad.exe, but you can see there's new stuff here in the window. I'm not 100% sure what trick they used to accomplish this. I didn't think there was an API to do this, but Norton desktop has completely overhauled the Windows common file dialogs. Their version of the file picker adds this row of toolbar buttons that lets you search for files, rename files, delete files, and make folders, all stuff that you couldn't do in Windows 3 that was super painful. There's also this description field, which is kind of weird. If you click on a file and then type something in, it will save whatever you type in a little hidden database somewhere, so you can have a comment on every file. It's a weird feature. But the really wild thing is if you press the View button here, it turns your file dialog into a full-fledged file manager. You get all the powers of the full file manager interface. Everything works. You've got all the buttons. You can drag files into and out of it. You can do everything from here. And when you're done and you have the file you want, you just select it, hit OK, and it's fed back to your program just like a normal file selector dialog. This is really impressive stuff. This backports capabilities that would not appear in mainline Windows for like eight years. I mean, this is a huge leap forward. It's particularly impressive when you realize that no one knew any of those things were going to happen yet. So there's more we could go over. I mean, there's all sorts of things that it changes. Everything in the OS has been touched in some way, it seems. And we could be here for hours going over the details, but I really recommend you just check it out yourself. However, let's look at the last part of Norton Desktop, which is the bundled applications. I think the bundled applications constituted a pretty significant chunk of the value proposition for Norton Desktop. Uh, see, as I said, there was Norton Utilities on the market for quite some time, but Norton Utilities were only provided as a DOS application up until the Windows 95 era. So I think that at this point in 1992-93, Norton considered Norton Desktop to be the Norton Utilities for Windows. So if we pull up the Norton Quick Launch Group, we can see the whole menagerie. And there's a ton here, and I'm going to go through them very quickly. Day Planner is exactly what it says, a day planner. Windows 3 included one, but it was pretty crappy. This one's much better. Speed Disk is a disk defragmenter. Modern OSs do this transparently and automatically, but back in the 90s, it was something you had to buy a program and set time aside for. Disk Doctor checks your file system integrity, which would also become an OS built-in feature by Windows 95. Smart Erase is the trash can, as we discussed. Rescue Disk makes a disk containing a bunch of stuff like your MBR, partition tables, autoexec, config.sys, and some useful utilities. Norton Antivirus is antivirus. Norton Backup is for backups. Scheduler looks like another date book, but it's actually an automation tool, similar to the scheduled tasks feature that would appear in Windows 95, which allowed you to run programs on a regular basis. System information gives you a report on your installed hardware. Desktop editor is a text editor that's a bit better than Notepad. Norton Viewer we described earlier. Superfind is an enhanced find utility that lets you search for files based on text inside of them and a lot of other things. Scriptmaker and dialog editor we'll come back to. Screensaver is what you think. Windows 3 had screensavers from the get-go, but holy god, the 90s were lousy with screensavers. People bought tons of them, and they were easy to make, so they showed up everywhere. 
Icon editor does what it says, disk copy does what it says, format disk does what it says. Keyfinder is basically a font explorer. Uh, true type fonts with custom symbols were becoming a big thing in this era, and this program would have helped you locate which character corresponded to a custom symbol, which would have been useful when you were programming new software that used a custom font. There are three calculators. Uh, the first is a financial calculator, which I think most people would call a scientific calculator because it has square roots. Second, there's a tape calculator, which I think most people would call a financial calculator since it mimics the functionality of an adding machine for totaling up receipts. The third one is a scientific calculator, which most people wouldn't recognize since hardly anyone uses reverse Polish notation anymore. All three calculators are pretty good. So that looks like quite a load of software, but out of the 25 programs there, only about five help you accomplish an actual human goal, and three of those are calculators. By that, I mean that most of these are meta software. They're ways to make your computer less irritating or to make it work better. But that's sort of the way things were back then. It's not only what Norton Utilities was about, it's kind of how software worked. People would buy dozens and dozens and dozens of very cheap programs to make their computer less intolerable, and then they would spend $300 on one big program, like a word processor or spreadsheet, that constituted most of the actual usefulness they got out of their computer. It still would have been cool if, like, they'd included a rudimentary word processor or something like that, but it was never in the cards. Now, inarguably, the most interesting program that comes with Norton Desktop, if not the most useful, is ScriptMaker. In this era, it wasn't really unusual to see random software packages just include a scratch-built scripting language, uh, and in fact, the first two versions of Norton Desktop had included something called Batch Builder, which was that. Norton built this as an enhanced batch file, but if you look at it, it's, it's not really true at all. It's more like its own scripting language that's purpose-built for the sort of stuff that Norton thought you might want to do if you were a power user. I'm not sure how far it goes, but it's fairly aspirational, but not as aspirational as ScriptMaker. ScriptMaker seems to be like a homebrew visual basic. Uh, I could be wrong about this, but it sure looks like basic syntax to me, and it appears to have much more extensive features than Batch Builder did. Uh, for instance, it looks like you can actually call out to Windows DLLs. I'm not sure if that's the case, but it, it really looks that way. There's actually a complete GUI dialog builder, so you can design forms just as easily as you did in Visual Basic, and this was pretty wild stuff for 1993. I mean, you would pay a lot of money for a development environment that could do this sort of thing, and here it is just rolled in as this little icon hanging out in the Norton desktop, a completely unrelated piece of software. I get that their intent for this was, again, to help the user automate their system, you know, launch programs and then interact with them once they're launched uh, in a, a non-user interactive way, but I think what they did is they scope crept all the way up to, oops, we just made Visual Basic. I'm not sure how capable this language is, but I get the strong feeling you could do almost anything in it if you were willing to put in the effort. So that's an incredible piece of scope creep, but that's really at home with UI enhancement software. See, think about how people design software. If you're designing an operating system, for instance, you need a one-size-fits-all product. So every time that someone has an idea for something to add to the user interface, you have to sit down and go, okay, who will this work for? Who will this make things harder for? Who will want to turn this off and be irritated that we left it on by default? And how many things do we want to leave in as switches so that we have to keep maintaining them even though maybe nobody is using them? UI enhancement packages, on the other hand, are entirely for power users, and power users are willing to put up with all sorts of stuff in order to make their computer more usable. So as a result, these end up being an object lesson in scope creep. Everything goes in, put it all on the pizza. By the time you decided that every user might want to edit their context menus, uh, why not decide that they might want to do regular expression file renaming with a keyboard shortcut? If you're going to enhance their taskbar by putting a little flyout menu on there so they can put more shortcuts on it, uh, why not put a weather widget on there? Why not put two more taskbars on there? And four weather widgets on each one. The sky's the limit. There's no reason to stop. When you check in on a program that's been in development like this for a while, you tend to find out that the default settings have become absurd. For instance, when you first start Norton Desktop 3, this huge toolbar that shows up is incredibly intimidating, if you ask me. It's so central and so large that it feels like it's saying, I should want to do the things that are on that toolbar more than anything else, which is not actually the case. When I discovered I could turn that toolbar off, I actually felt relief. It felt like it had been yelling at me. The buttons are so big. They're bigger than the desktop icons. I mean, whose decision was that? I think what leads to this is that when you're working on a UI enhancement, at the outset you're trying to onboard new users, just like an operating system, but by the end of development, you're only thinking about the power users, because they're the ones who have been in contact this whole time, asking for you to do this and that to make their special, unique workflow work better. 
Eventually, the developers start to enter the Twilight Zone, where they think that the average individual wants to have seven weather widgets on their taskbar by default. This sort of behavior is all over modern software. Uh, for instance, 7-Zip by default adds a context menu item to all your folders that adds a file to a zip and then emails it. I cannot imagine this is useful to more than a quarter of a percent of their users. I can't even picture what I would ever use this for. It is such a wild decision. But for those few people who want it, it is extremely helpful, and they don't want to have to go and turn it on manually every time they install 7-Zip on a new machine. And so the developers have favored them with the defaults instead of me, the guy who just wants Extract. You have to pick someone to be your primary user base that you're going to model things for, and I think with UI enhancements, it is commonly the case that you end up modeling after the wild outliers because they're the ones who are actually involving themselves in the development process and getting back to you. So Norton Desktop has a certain amount of odd defaults, but in addition to that, there's also a certain amount of jank. For the most part, there aren't functional issues, although I did find a couple. Uh, for instance, uh, if you open up the enhanced file selector and then you drill down to a zip file, you can't pick something inside of it. And I can understand why that happens, but they don't even give you an error message or anything. You just think you didn't double click fast enough. Also, if you then cancel out of the enhanced dialog, it takes you back to the original old style dialog. And I can kind of see why they did that, but it still feels really janky. Mostly, however, I just think the UI is kind of ugly. Why are the toolbars and the file browsers at the bottom instead of the top, which I think was standard at this point in other software? Why are they text instead of icons, which was also standard in other software? Why is the title bar on the desktop background on by default? It doesn't seem to serve any purpose except to take up space. Why is the desktop toolbar so big? Why are the quick launch icons on the desktop have these thick 3D borders around them that you can't turn off instead of just looking like the drive icons? And why are user created shortcuts also made with a thick 3D border, but a different one? Why does every single Norton program group window have this little treasure box button that just takes you to the tip of the day? I've played with thousands of UI enhancements in my life. It was a thing I was fascinated with uh, way back when I was a kid, and they always kind of end up like this, not quite polished. You can see how they could have looked like an intrinsic part of the operating system, but they don't quite get there. They fall just short, and often through what appear to be deliberate decisions. In the enhanced file picker dialogues, there's this bright blue text in the corner just to remind you that they've enhanced the dialogue. Why did they do that? And if they were going to do it, why not make it black? Why does it have to be blue? It totally violates the Windows design guidelines. It looks completely out of place. You already bought the program. What's the point of this? So that sort of thing bugs me because I, I, I can't square myself with tools that feel unpolished, but I think a lot of people probably don't have this issue and Norton Desktop was probably very well loved by the people who bought it. I'm not really sure. I didn't go through you know a bunch of magazines looking for reviews, but when I did see it in magazines, the people seemed to like it and Symantec did make it for three years running, so they must have thought there was some demand. And on its face, it looks like a great enhancement. I think that Norton Desktop is an incredibly impressive piece of software with a lot of potential. I think if you installed this in 1993 and got yourself to learn how to use it, integrate it into your workflow, the ways in which this would speed up and streamline how you use your computer would have been dramatic. You would not have regretted purchasing this. I just think there were probably a lot of people who bought it and then just kind of went, ugh, what is this? And then took it back. I'm sure I'm gonna get tons of comments from people telling me they love this program or they hated this program back in the day. I can't put myself in the shoes of someone from 1993. I wasn't quite there, but to me, this looks like a massive improvement for the Windows 3 interface. And I should point out that while this is the Windows 3.1 edition, and while it does make more improvements than the previous versions of Norton Desktop, they were not small enhancements on their own. The file manager, for instance, uh, might be a huge improvement in 3.1, but the improvements that it offered to 3.0 were even bigger because the Windows 3.0 file manager was basically the DOS dir command with dipping mustards. And of course, there's just the desktop. Adding a desktop to Windows 3.0 was bolting on an improvement that would not appear on the PC until 1995. It's a remarkable achievement for Symantec, and if you're interested in poking around with it, I highly recommend checking it out. There's a lot more in there that I haven't described. So anyway, there's my review of a program from 1993, such as it is. Um, if you liked this, it would be cool if you could subscribe to let me know you like this sort of thing. If you really liked this, it would be cool if you could go support me on Patreon so that I can afford to buy software like this from eBay that has not yet been archived. There's lots of programs like this that have not been preserved, and I'd like to go buy them, but people charge ridiculous prices for them, 30 bucks, 60 bucks. It's hard for me to afford them, and I'd like to start buying these things before they disappear forever, and your money would help a lot with that project.
I would like to shout out the people who have recently subscribed to my higher Patreon tiers. Unfortunately, I'm recording this video before I go on a big trip, so I don't actually know who that will be. I will shout you all out when I get back. I will, however, shout out all the people who are currently on there in those upper tiers. Thank you so much. It has made it so much easier for me to do what I'm doing. I appreciate all your support and all the people who are watching this. Thank you.